Got the pass caught and out of bounds at the 33 yard line. And Inky Johnson is down on the field. Mm, that's not good. And I can see the play unfold. I can see it clear like it's in HD. And I see the quarterback rolling and he's dropping back. And as soon as I hit him, something happened that never happened to me before in my life. As soon as I hit him, it seemed as if every breath in my body left. My body went completely limp. I lost control. I fell to the ground. I blacked out. It never happened to me before. When my eyes opened, my teammates ran over to me. They said, Ink, get up. Let's rock. Let's go. Let's close them out. I said, I can't. They said, what do you mean you can't? You always get up, man. You're our guy. I said, I know, but I can't. They said, what do you mean you can't? I said, I can't move. I said, there's a shock going from the crown of my head to the bottom of my feet. I can't feel anything. The shock eventually left, but it stayed in my right arm and hand. They brought the spine board out. They put me on the spine board. They're willing me off the field. We get to the ambulance, and my father's standing there. And I say to my father, I said, Pops, I got him, right? I put it on him, right? He said, yep, Ink, but I think you got the worst part of this one. They rolled me up in the ambulance. They said, Ink, we'll take you over, run a couple tests. It's football. Things happen. You'll be fine, man. They take me over. They run their tests. They bring me back into a room. My mother comes in, kisses me, says a prayer, cracks a joke, says, Ink, you'll be fine. Football. Things happen. And she's going to walk out, and I'm watching my mother walk out. But as she's exiting the room, I can hear footsteps from the opposite side. And when I turn to look, it's the head doctor, and he's running at this point, and he's screaming. And I'll never forget, he says, guys, guys, get in here. Got to rush this kid back to emergency surgery. He's about to die. And I wake up the next day. My career's over. Almost lost my life. Got a paralyzed right arm and hand. And my life has completely changed. And it was in that moment that I realized I had no control over my life. Because I had been working from the time I was seven until the time I was 20, and every action, every decision, every choice was geared toward me trying to make it to this thing called the NFL, the National Football League. And as soon as I got close to it and thought it was about to happen, it was as if God said, not yet. I want to redirect you and take you this way. And I was like, God, but I'm right here. Like, let me get to the NFL so I can help my family and then redirect me. And God was saying, no, I got something even greater, even sweeter. And I know you can't see it right now, but I need you to trust me. And I'm like, God, I need you to trust me. Like, let me get it, God. I grew up two bedroom home, 14 people sleeping on the floor. The first time I uttered the words, I want to go to the NFL, the words that followed it up was, maybe I can get my own bed one day. Because me and my cousins were sleeping on pallets. I just wanted to get my own bed and pull my mother off the double shift at Wendy's. And so when I got to the moment that I thought it was about to manifest, I'm like, Lord, just give it to me. Let me get the contract, go back, help my family, and then you can redirect me. And the Lord was like, no, I need you to trust me. Even though you can't trace me, Inky Johnson, I need you to trust me and just follow what I got. I need you to rejoice in the midst of opposition, in the midst of adversity, in the midst of trials. It's a big difference between quoting scripture and having to live it. And I was finally at a point in my life to where I had to literally live the scripture. I had to live Jeremiah 29, 11, when it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. Inky, I need you to trust me. I'm like, Lord, I need you to trust me. People were coming over to my bed saying, Ink, man, you deserve it, man. You're a good guy, man. You deserve the NFL. You work hard. You never cheated the game. You did things the right way. You deserve it, man. This shouldn't have happened to you. And I'm sitting there, and I don't know if you've ever been through something that the situation holds so much conviction that it makes you self-assess and question your principles and your values about life. And I was so embarrassed because I felt like I had shortchanged God. I'm like, man, with all the gifts, talents, and abilities that God had blessed you with, the only thing you were focused on was the NFL? That's low-hanging fruit. I'm like, Ink, was that it? Like if my father is sitting there and everybody is analyzing the situation, trying to see how I'm going to respond, and my father's on fire. And the first thing my father says to me is, Ink, how does this God that you love so much let this happen to you? 
How does the God you go to church for let this happen to you? How does this God you pray to, son, let this happen to you? I see when you make a play and you say, glory to God. Well, if God is so good, Inc., how could this God let this happen to you? Because through his lenses, all he can see is, my son is hurt. My father came to me and said, Inc., you know what? I'm going to come and stay with you for the next 30 days. I had never been on the same roof as my father. I'm talking about staying for consecutive days. That never happened. He said, I'm going to come. I'm going to take you to class. I'm going to take you to church. I'm going to take you to rehab for your arm. I'm going to do everything with you. I'm like, okay. And so my father would take me to FCA discipleship, and he would be there, and he would stand literally outside of the door, and he would hear me and the chaplain going back and forth, and he would just stand there. When the session would end, he would say, ain't you good? I would say, yes, sir. He would take me. And so when I would get on my knees to pray, my father would always come by my room, and he would say, ain't you need anything? I would say, no, sir, I'm good. And on the 29th day, I find it odd. My number is 29. My favorite Bible verse, Jeremiah 29, 11. On the 29th day, I'm on my knees to pray, and my father comes by my room. He says, hey, Ink, you need anything? I said, no, sir, I'm good. He steps back into my room, and he says, Ink, man, I want to talk to you about something. I'm still on my knees. I said, yes, sir. He said, you know that God you pray to? I said, yes, sir. He said, you know that God I take you to discipleship about? I said, yes, sir. You see, you know that God take you to FCA, church, all of that? I said, yes, sir. He said, if that God can help you handle this situation the way you're handling it, he said, son, I want to give my life to Christ. My father was headed down a path of destruction. He had three daughters. When my father got saved and got his salvation, my father's household was corrected. My three teammates and roommates and best friends that were in my household all of them gave their life to Christ. And so when I look at this situation and people call the million dollar question, Inky, why wouldn't you change what happened to you? I'm like, you serious? I'm like, let me tell you why I wouldn't change it. If I had to put on a scale the NFL, my father's salvation, my three best friends' salvation, if I had to weigh it on a scale and, and they said, Inky, pick, what would you choose? Ten out of ten times, I'm going to pick my friend's salvation and my father's salvation. Because I know, I'm, I'm wise enough to understand, this is the real contract. And it's long and it's rich. It's more fulfilling. It's sweeter. It might involve a little pain and a little pruning that you don't understand. But when you come through it, you'll be a better person because of it. In Colossians 3.23, it says, do all things as if you're doing it for the glory of God. And if I'm doing something for the glory of God, at a certain point, when the opposition, the adversity, and the challenges hit, I rejoice because I know it's God trying to take me to the next level. And so the discomfort for me is great. Like, at a certain point, the comfort zone, young people have to understand, the comfort zone is a beautiful place, but nothing ever grows there. You can be comfortable all you want. But you can equate comfort to being stagnant. If a person never wants to grow, it's heavy sacrifice involved and it's heavy discomfort involved. Because we all gonna hit that wall. We're all gonna hit opposition. We're all gonna hit adversity. But I think we all know at the core, it's never about what happens to you, it's about how you respond to it. You can control that, right? And if you're resilient, you'll get whatever you're looking for if you're resilient. If you're consistent, You'll keep it. But if you're grateful, whatever you want will increase. In life, people don't burn out because of what they do. People burn out because life makes them forget why they do it. And so every single day, with whatever you do, if it's football, if it's basketball, whatever the case may be, every single day when you do it, before you approach it, ask yourself a question. Like at the core, I'm talking about with conviction. Say, why do I really do it? But most importantly, who am I really doing it for? Am I doing it for my ego? Am I doing it for my pride? Am I doing it for superficial or materialistic? Or am I doing it to bring glory to the Lord? And so every single day of my natural born life, I'm going to get up and I'm going to use this arm, not just with like how I live my life, I'm going to use this arm every single day of my life to impact another life.